I'm going to talk about computer vision, which is an area where I've worked in for probably most of my adult life. And I think it's fair to say that there aren't really any overarching theories yet, or rather, there is a huge sort of fist fight between competing theories. And because of that, the lecture sort of changes emphasis. Instead of me just fact, 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 which is what I've been doing in previous lectures, now, ladies and gentlemen, we have some opinion coming in. Okay, so um, I hope it will be evident when I'm giving you the benefit of my opinion and when I'm giving you a fact, but if you, if you have anxiety about that, you can, you can tweet about it or whatever. And I, I sort of feel, um, do you know the Tom Lehrer song? You know, there's antimony and arsenic and oh, aluminum and selenium and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and helium. And, you know, and he goes on to list all of the elements. And um, Tom Lehrer, of course, was a mathematician and he was doing two things there, I think. Not only was he listing the elements in a very amusing way, he was also pointing out that there's an element of science which is sort of listing various things. There isn't a grand unified theory for all of science. There's a series of theories. So that's what it's going to be. I'm going to be, I'm going to be singing a bit of a Tom Lehrer song around bits of computer vision. I work in computer vision because I think this is a very interesting uh, situation to be in. Uh, but if your mind is spinning by the end of it, don't worry, that's, that's the normal situation for people working in, in computer vision. So most hum computer vision studies are sort of intimately linked to human vision. And I think it's sort of fair to say that um, there's been this sort of um, constant reference between human or animal vision and uh, computer vision throughout the development of the, uh, the subject. This is a famous picture known as Atneve's cat after the uh, psychologist Fred Atneve. And it makes several points, but the point I want to make, I think, is that most people would perceive this picture as a sleeping cat. That was certainly what it was meant to portray. Um, if you imagine the equivalent, which was an image, many, many millions of pixel elements would be required in order to convey the same information. Yet, this is informationally equivalent to the large version of the image. And if you want to prove that, try sending images of your sleeping cat or dog by your mobile telephone, and at the end of the month, you can measure the data bill, right? It's very substantial. Uh, so for those of you watching from overseas, it's even more substantial than it is in the UK. UK benefits from quite low data charges. Um, but it's a very substantial thing, but the, saying the word on the telephone, sleeping cat, is fairly cheap. We seem to be able to transmit these high-level concepts, um, the, the algorithmic view of information, and yet the picture has all of this low-level information. Now, that's something that's going to come out in this lecture. If there is a unifying theme of vision, it is that challenge, which is the semantic level, which I'm talking about here, is very much more compressed than the, the sort of uh, the, the data level. Now, part of this is to do with that sort of common understanding of the human uh, uh, condition. You know, some, some of vision is related to the way that we think. So if you look at this, what appears to be a sort of random collection of dots, I doubt very much whether you can see very much in that random collection of dots. But if I make a slight um, adjustment to it, then it becomes very evident what we're looking at. I don't know if anyone rec particularly recognises that face, do they? Exactly right. The lady in the audience says, isn't it Edward Monk, the, the scream? It is, exactly that. And I... Well, exactly, in the sense I got a copy of the screen and very carefully positioned the dots over there and then added the other dots to make it look like a random collection of dots. So uh, you and me, at least, madam, have transferred uh, some very complex semantic information between each other with only three dots, which was... Uh, you, you literally joined the dots of my thoughts there. Um, and this is a great challenge for computer vision. It seems to be something that we do. Computer, uh, human vision seems to be so sort of effortless yet is so uh, complex to describe. So if we look a sort of at a conventional picture of human vision, then it might look something like this. Um, we have some sort of illuminant over here on the left, and light is coming out of this illuminant, and it might be described by a spectrum of uh, uh, energy here. 
So this is a wavelength along here, and this is something that uh, is measuring power. The ray comes in here, it bounces off the apple, which has a reflectance spectrum, red in this case, and then it comes into my eye, um, and I perceive this power spectral distribution with some color sensors. Uh, I have um, uh, some color sensors called rods and cones in my eyes, and then my brain says, ah, oh, yes, I, I recognize those response from those color sensors, which I perceive to be a color that I now know to be called red. Um, and if you're interested in this, there's a fascinating science called colour science, which talks all about, about the way uh, colour works and the way how it is that, um, you know, we have colour, common, co common names for colour. Uh, there's lots of psychological work on colour naming, if you're interested in that very fascinating area. And, of course, it's very commercially relevant um, for, for reasons which, well, well I can talk, tell you now. I mean, it, it is obviously very important that the devices that you have access to are able to render and capture color in a sensible way. Now, when we move into the computer domain, uh, we are all familiar with the, uh, an image. This is a uh, rather beautiful scene from the University of East Anglia, which is my home university. Uh, and if we blow that up, we get this sort of rather gritty collection of units, which I'm sure you're aware are all called pixels. So each one of these little rectangular boxes is known as a, as a pixel. And um, or unless you work for IBM, where mysteriously they're always called PELs, uh, if you work for IBM, you're <coughs> unable to say more than one syllable. So they become PELs. Okay? Um, so this rectangular grid of pixels usually has, if they're color, has three numbers. It doesn't always have three, but three is a good start. Uh, so e this is the red number, the green number, and the blue number abbreviated to RGB, okay? So everybody, I think, is sort of broadly familiar with that idea. And so um, an image uh, looks something like this. They're often referred to as three planes. And for those of you who are into computers, they're usually represented by eight-bit unsigned integers, um, uh, and which means a number between 0 and 255. 0 is usually black, and 255 is the maximum intensity. So if they're all at 255, we have a color of white. If they're all at 0, we have a color of black. If they're equal but some other color, we have a gray. And so that is known as the, uh, the, the gray line. OK, so far, so good. Um, I don't know if anyone's sort of ever shown you inside a, a digital camera, but. Uh, they look something like this. This is a, this is a rather I I expensive version. And the, uh, this bit of the camera has been pretty standard since, um, oh, I don't know, 19, 1950s, I should think, you know, the, the single lens reflex camera. This is the shutter here, um, which pops up and down at incredible speed. This is the sensor. OK, so on here are uh, millions of little RGB sensors. And uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about that because it's rather um, it's a rather sort of fascinating um, bit of um, electro uh, electronics. Let's have a quick look at it. Now, depending on the value of the camera, there are sort of three types of sensor in operation. So the one that is um, used in expensive cameras um, is called a tri-chip sensor. So the white light comes into a prism like this and the red light comes out in this way, and on the top here we would have mounted the red sensor, here we have the green sensor, and here we have the blue sensor. And that's great. It does have a bit of a commercial problem because nobody really likes cameras with great big prisms in the middle of them. Right? They're heavy and awkward. And furthermore, if you drop it on the floor, the sensors have an annoying habit of falling off and you lose all your alignment, so you ruin the camera. So they're not very, they're less and less popular, although if you can get, you can imagine the, the challenge of getting these things exactly aligned, it's a bit of a fiddle-faddle. The good thing about that is that's great for undergraduate students because it very closely corresponds to the data model, which is these three planes. The reality um, actually looks something like that for most cameras. I'll just briefly mention in dispatches this sensor where the sensors are layered on top of one another, beautiful system, so you get perfect alignment. Uh, this is uh, called the Foveon uh, sensor system, 
uh, very uh, clever and patented, which means it's not widely used. This is the system that we would normally uh, use. So we have some photonic sensors here. We have these little lenses which focus the light down. And the R, the G, and the B are unequally interspersed on your uh, camera. So if you have a mobile phone in your pocket that takes cameras, almost certainly it's using this form, which is known as the Bayer array. And uh, the Bayer array solves us for an immediate problem, which I'm sure you can see, which is there is no, for example, green sensor here. Uh, there is no red sensor here. It's slightly displaced. So what happens in the camera is interpolation, right? They make it up, right? Now, that's, you know, it's not a guess. It's a guess based upon these neighbors. So these are really measured, but this one is usually some sort of linear or nonlinear interpolant between here. And occasionally you can see that if you get a picture from your mobile phone and you zoom in on, say, a white to black edge, you'll often see color fringes as you go down the edge. Uh, it's a very common um, problem and vast amounts of resource um, are devoted from the big mobile phone manufacturers to try and make that uh, better and there's a group of researchers at the University of East Anglia where I work who single-mindedly work on these uh, things. That isn't the only thing that goes on in a camera, I should say. Um, there are innumerable little non-linear tiny little adjustments that go on in a, in a camera. And I think it's fair to say that most of them are secret or was not secret, not even known. So if you have an expensive camera, it can deliver something called a raw image, and that's meant to be the numbers as recorded on these sensors. But if you have a cheap camera, like me, you've got no idea. Right? So the first thing to realize is, unlike a microphone, which is the thing we use for recording uh, acoustic signals, the camera, which is the thing we record optical signals in, is really secret and weird, right? Lots of weirdness happens inside that camera. Uh, tone curves, nonlinear adjustments, noise reduction, filtering, dynamic range correction, multiple image composition. You know, the list is, en list is endless, and they're all designed to make you think that the camera in your mobile phone is fantastic, when in fact it's a crummy old Bayer array. OK, so that's the first interesting observation. Now, of course, the image out of a camera presents itself like this. This is what we're used to seeing, uh, this beautiful uh, red, green, and blue image. And these are the channels of that individual image. So this, uh, I can tell, is the red channel. And I can tell that because the red here appears white in the red image. So these two are very similar. This, I'm guessing, is the, well, I know because I, I made this slide, is the green channel, and this is the blue channel. And you can tell that because the blue here is slightly lighter than the green. Notice there's a little bit of green in this and this. So this is what uh, gets transmitted across the sort of the airwaves of, um, you know, uh, of, of, uh, of, of of uh, the United Kingdom and the rest of the world. And this is what we perceive. Now, this is a fascinating uh, sort of observation. I mean, the first thing to say is this RGB here, it's called the tri-stimulus assumption, makes a pretty dramatic assumption, which is that the red, green, and blue sensors in, say, your camera are pretty much the same as they are in your camera, which they're not, um, and that when we display them on my screen here, I get the same impression as on the projector, which is displaying it, or for those watching online, you know, as the online streaming. There's a sort of fundamental assumption we're making here. And by the way, I haven't calibrated any of these images, but I can tell you they all look pretty similar. It's a wonderful bit of approximate. Just so we're clear, though, it is an approximation, and there are quite a few colors that simply cannot be represented by the RGB assumption. Furthermore, um, it is intimately related to the way that we perceive vision as humans. We use some approximation to these RGB sensors, and there's quite a bit of work, and there's a huge and very interesting work about exactly how you choose these sensors in cameras, which ones you should use, and so on. So, for example, I'll just sort of pick one uh, little snippet from that at random. Um, 
if you want a very quick approximation to the grayscale image, there are better ways of doing this, you might just pick the green image. That's because the green sensor in most cameras is, has a broader spectral response than the others. So it just happens to be closer to gray. I mean, what you normally do is weight these together and get a grayscale approximation, which is often used in computer vision, but this is a quick approximation. Now, this has all sorts of interesting um, observations. Um, I don't know if anyone remembers uh, this image. Does anyone remember? This, is, this was called the, the dress that broke the internet. And um, it caused considerable surprise. Uh, a nice lady took a photograph of a dress she was hoping to wear at a, an occasion and posted it on an Instagram. And somewhat to her surprise, um, half the people she sent it to described it as blue and black, and the other half of people she sent it to described it as gold and black. I myself can only see one sort of dress here, which is the blue and black. I don't know if anyone in the physical audience can see gold and black, can they? Gold, uh, gold, sorry, gold and white. Yeah, you can see it, you, you weirdos. Ugh, ugh, free. Okay. So there was a theory, the press went wild over this, and they particularly went wild over it because somebody called Kim Kardashian saw gold and white, and somebody called Kanye West saw blue and black. So, well, I'm, in, I'm with Kanye, Kanye, so uh, I clearly think he's right. What's going on here? Actually, on my screen here, it is closer to gold and white. Um, there are several effects going on here, and uh, probably time presses on us too much really to describe it, but it, it is an example of some uh, fundamental limitations in the image device, and there's also an issue here of illuminant calibration. You've got this sort of rather goldish light in the back here, which is fooling some people's colour constancy um, into thinking that the dress is gold and white. I think I'm right in saying the dress is really blue and black. So uh, those of you who see it as gold and white, just, you know, go and have your eyes tested. Um, right, now, how does this all sort of play out? Well, for mathematicians who work on computer vision, we love a good approximation. And so the approximation we use for most cameras in computer vision is this, which is a box with a hole in it. Right? It's called a pinhole camera. And real cameras, of course, are much more complex than that, and there's a fascinating study of how these work, but broadly speaking, that's the, uh, that's the model. Um, and uh, I'm sure you're sort of familiar with the pinhole camera. If you're not, I'd thoroughly recommend going into a, uh, one of these rooms known as a camera obscura, a large room with a small hole in it, and you get a wonderful uh, image on the, the back face of the wall. For those of you who are not able to travel to the... Um, uh, Exploratorium in uh, California, then I uh, recommend pulling the curtains in your room and lying on your bed. And if you look up at the ceiling, you will see an inverted image of what's going on outside in your ceiling. It's a sort of uh, it's cheap poor man's, uh, poor, poor person's uh, camera obscura. Anyway, these uh, cameras sort of get characterized by a set of parameters um, which these are the parameters that, that are related to the camera, and these are parameters related to the, where the camera sits in the scene. And one part of vision, in fact, this was, this was all the rage. Um, maybe I was going to say a few years ago, and I think, honestly, perhaps about 20 years ago, we, we were obsessed with solving problems related to this geometry. And so, uh, Obviously, you can do um, this sort of thing, which is an example of stereo vision. So here we have some rays coming from my subject's ear, uh, this attractive-looking Microsoft dog, as it happened. And the rays come in through these stereo pair of cameras. We can, if we can measure those rays, we could measure this distance here, I'll call it L. We could measure this distance here, I'll call it R. The difference in those distances we call disparity. And that's proportional to this quantity, the depth. So that's broadly speaking how depth ma mapping works. So if anyone has a Microsoft uh, Xbox with the depth sensor, what's it called, Connect, I think, 
Um, that's broadly how, how it works. You have two cameras, you know where they are, and you can solve all the geometric um, problems. If you want to see it in um, perhaps more practical operation, this is an example of um, some uh, data from the Kitty benchmark data, which relates to um, driving tasks. Uh, it's from the University of Karlsruhe. You can download it if you wish, if you want to do that. And so what you should be noticing here is that things in the distance are colored uh, sort of cool colors. And then as we get closer, each one of these things is assigned a different color. So this is called a dense depth map. Okay, and dense depth maps are the sort of stuff of self-driving vehicles. Now, all well and good. And so long as I know all of these camera parameters and I know the distance between the cameras, then I can solve for what's called metric uh, stereo. I can actually convert these numbers into physical depths. So I can say, oh yes, that's 15 meters away. Actually, I should point out that we don't always have that information. Um, we, we might know we've got two cameras, but we might not know all of their parameters. That's a beautiful problem, the uncalibrated stereo problem that um, we solve all the time, I suspect. You know, I, I don't remember measuring the distance between my eyes as a child and programming it into my brain, and I don't remember measuring the, the uh, distance of the, the uh, pixels on the back of my eyeballs. You know? um, I just seem to have worked it out. And there's some beautiful mathematics uh, devised on, on this problem, which by, as soon as someone says beautiful mathematics, you know it's horrendously complex and difficult, don't you? Um, but I have a sort of rather uh, sort of, what's the word, something that I can understand. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly play you a clip that explains, uh, in perhaps better than I can, the problem of uncalibrated vision. What do we do for the next two weeks? Well, I put on the kettle. <laughs> yeah, go on. Must be one of the ones that clicks off automatically. Yes. Bit of steam there. <laughs> Incidentally, did you bring any tea bags? No. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, one last time. These are small, but the ones out there are far away. <laughs> Small, far away. <laughs> I forget it. Yeah, so uh, that, this clip was brought to my attention by a very intelligent person called Andrew Fitzgibbon, and it's exactly the problem that we have with uncalibrated vision. Uncalibrated vision cannot tell the difference between small and far away. That said, your own uh, perception of depth is not always uh, to be trusted.
What a beautiful video that is. I mean, I, I have to, it's available on YouTube. Um, regrettably, the people who produced it didn't make it clear that it's an advertisement for Ray-Ban spectacles. And so I feel <laughs> duty bound to tell you that Ray-Ban spectacles are most excellent uh, spectacles and you should go out and buy some immediately uh, because they've obviously devoted a lot of effort to, to looking at this. Now, so when we move to movies, things are a little bit uh, different, of course. Um, and... The, uh, probably one of the first people to look at the movie was this uh, interesting man called Edward uh, Mybridge, who has, uh, for some reason, changed... Well, he, he, I think he thought that his real name, which was Edward Muggeridge, wasn't very interesting, so he became Edward Muggeridge. And uh, as far as I remember, um, we'll have to... Uh, there is another Gresham professor of uh, film, actually. We should ask Ian Christie whether this is true. There was a sort of bet between uh, Muggeridge and others as to whether a horse's feet left the ground... When, uh, when running, and what he did was set up a whole load of cameras uh, connected by thin uh, strings, and he galloped a horse past these cameras, the strings pulled the trigger, and he got this sequence of movies and was able to answer that question uh, very nicely. Um, uh, so you can look at the individual frames, and you can put them all together, and you get this convincing impression of motion. Uh, this was quite a long time before the film The Matrix. Uh, I don't know if you've seen The Matrix. The Matrix introduced a whole load of uh, new visual effects, one of which was called bullet time, which was um, achieved by a whole rack of cameras being triggered at just the right moment so you could follow people in their motions. Um, and there was a film made about how you made The Matrix, they were very proud of their achievements, but I have to tell you that a good old Edward Muggeridge got there first. Okay, now, one of the issues with this um, is the sampling period. You obviously have uh, to make a choice about how often you take these pictures. And uh, this problem uh, soon arose in quite old movies. Um, this is known as a sampling problem, and I talked a little bit about this in the acoustic uh, domain. If you get the sampling wrong, you can find that things that are moving in the movies look rather strange. And um, in the movies, this is often called the wagon wheel effect after these historic movies, where the, the wheels of the cart appear to move backwards instead of forwards. Now, you're all very familiar with this. You've seen it so much that you barely comment on it. It's only when it happens uh, very dramatically that it sort of becomes quite obvious that there is a problem. And... Here's a wonderful mo movie shot by a guy called Chris Fay, who took quite a lot of trouble to get this movie. It's taken from uh, the helicopter port in downtown Hong Kong. And I think I'll just play it and it will become quite evident what the difficulty with uh, sampling is. So it's horribly weird, isn't it, watching this uh, helicopter. Um, and it, uh, what he'd done was he, he'd picked a mobile phone which has a variable uh, frame rate and very carefully adjusted the frame rate to get the, the uh, picture he desired. It's quite difficult to do. I tried to, uh, by bizarre, for bizarre reasons, I have a helicopter pad just outside my office and I tried to do it the other day and, and failed. So I'm you know, heavily thankful and reliant on this wonderful illustration. Uh, the fact is that uh, movies are, and video data that we deal with are often undersampled. So what that means is that there are errors due to motion blur, and that's caused by the shutter not being quick enough, but there's also these, these sampling errors. And they're very common in, in movie data uh, that we have to deal with in computer vision. Um, you would very much like often to run at sort of hundreds and hundreds of frames per second. I work in lip reading, so I would love to be able to do that because the lips move too quickly to capture, really. But the problem then is you have to have incredibly bright lights in order to uh, illuminate them because the shutter speed goes down. So you end up in this sort of compromised position, which would be completely unacceptable in audio, but we have to put up with it. Even putting up with it, there's an issue. 
And the issue is this, that if I had a 4K television signal, which is not unreasonable, you know, your, your sort of average uh, iPhone now will produce uh, this sort of resolution, um, and I multiply the resolution, this is the number of pixels, by the number of bytes, by the number of bits, by 30 frames a second, which is not unreasonable, I think you end up with around six gigabits per second. That, that is a lot, okay? That is a horrendous amount of a data. It's so horrendous that it's actually very tricky to really transmit it. You know, um, this lecture is being live streamed and we are certainly not transmitting, although we have good cameras, we are certainly not transmitting at five uh, gigabits per second. You know, we're, in we're giving this lecture in London. Uh, I think you know, the data police of London would be knocking on our door saying, what the hell are you doing trying to stream five gig six gigabits a second? It can't be done. Um, even with compression, 25 megabits a second is a real challenge. Okay, so this does lead us, this sort of tension leads us to one, a sort of general theory of vision. Um, and it can be sort of pictified like this, that often called the image pyramid. At this level, we've got lots and lots of fine detail, you know, millions and millions of these pixels. So the information looks daunting. At this level, we've got inference. Inference is me saying, oh, it's a picture of a horse, or it's a sleeping cat. And the, the vision chain really has to get from here down to here. So that, I think almost everyone working in vision would accept that as a contention. Now then, how to do it? Ah, well, that's, that's a challenge, right? That's where we get into this sort of multi-headed um, multi approach. And just to explain that a little bit more, I, I'll talk about one of the theories that people use to process these things. And to do that, um, to explain that sort of the scale space approach to things, which is um, a rather grand uh, theory relating to vision, I'll just sort of show you a little bit more about um, an image. Uh, so this is an image of my computer on the desk. And um, let's imagine I just take a slice through here. You can see, actually it is a little bit tricky to see, this is a transition going from dark here to mid-gray here. And then this is me hitting this book. And then we're coming across here. What's very apparent about this is several things. The first thing is... Um, this doesn't look like an audio signal at all. It's very sharp edged. It is not additive. Okay, so um, when you're looking at me now, uh, my beautiful tie is, is here, you're not seeing a combination of my tie and the shirt beneath it. You're just seeing my tie. It's called a replacement signal model. Now there are exceptions to the replacement model. I mean, when you look at um, X-ray images, of course, you do see a superposition of things, but what we're used to seeing is this replacement model. And it has some quite dramatic effects. It means that a lot of the theory that's been developed for acoustic uh, signals and all sorts of other signals doesn't really work. And um, we don't really have great replacement uh, signal models. The other thing that uh, you might observe from this is that this is a generalization, but generally speaking, objects that you can see are brighter than or darker than their immediate background. That's, if they weren't, you wouldn't see them, right? They would merge together. Now, there are exceptions, like with all things, but on the whole, that is, I would say that is true in most of the images we're looking at. And if you accept that and you put it together with the other thing, which is there's a pressing need to simplify images because they just have too much data in them, then you end up with a, a general principle, which is, if you are going to simplify images, and you need to simplify them, then you have to do it in a way that does not introduce any more extrema. Extrema are local maxima and minima. So if you're prepared to accept that, then that's really very useful because you are now constructing what's called a scale space. And uh, they look a bit like this. The beautiful thing about scale space vision systems is they immediately sort of eliminate from the frame vast quantities of possible simplifications because they do not satisfy these scale space axioms as they, as they are called. There are a few more, but that, that's the principal one. So if we took an image like this 
and we blurred it using a filter that's shaped like a Gaussian filter, it's an, usually known as linear diffusion, then we get this progressively simpler version of the images, more and more blurred. Now, when this was discovered, beautiful theory, originally initiated by a guy called Andrew Witkin and then um, sorted out, and if you're interested in the technicalities, the transcript of this lecture has, some, has a reference to a... I felt guilty about this. It references a book by a very brilliant man called Tony Lindbergh. I think it's fair to say that Tony Lindbergh's book is not your average bedtime reading, but it is a very beautiful book. Um, this is an incredibly popular way of simplifying images, and at the time, it, we were very excited about it. And the reason we were very excited about it at the time, just to hark back to what I was saying earlier, was people thought that V1, the visual first part of your visual processing cortex, was itself forming Gaussian filters. Wow, this is amazing synergy. So we all got very excited. And then the, uh, then the biologists started to say, oh, sorry, it's not Gaussian, it's something else. And then so we got a bit bored with all of that, and it sort of fell out of fashion a bit. If you're prepared to use nonlinear processing, then there are alternatives. Um, I like this one because I worked on it for a number of years, and I think it's very beautiful. I think it's fair to say that despite the sort of theoretical power and beauty of scale space vision systems, it's not really very heavily used in its pure form. I think most people will acknowledge the need for this increased uh, simplification, but there are plenty of alternatives. Um, there's a very nice system um, called wavelets, and wavelets simplify the image by throwing data away. They decimate the image as you um, go from coarse to fine, which they do in octaves. There's lots of smoothing, there's lots of downsampling. I should also mention a system developed by David Marr called the Primal Sketch, which was all about, he said, well, the basic features of images are all lines and corners and so on, and well, I'll do this sketch together. And they all have this same architecture, though. At the bottom end are pixels and low-level features, and at the top end is inference. And the one thing I could, you know, that is often a common feature in vision and dealing with scale, which is something we do so effortlessly, is a big challenge for vision systems. Okay, enough about the theory. Let's have a look, quick look at some applications. So I've picked a couple of applications that I admire in computer vision because I think they give you a flavor for what's going on. And the first one I've picked is a beautiful system developed by John Daugman. Um, John has worked on something called the Iris Code. And he's devised a vision system that's able to identify your iris, extract this region here, and convert it into a binary code. What's so beautiful about this is that um, a perfect biometric, as it's called, a system that identifies you, is unique for every single individual in the, uh, in the room and watching online, and is... Uh, equally distant from all other individuals. So we don't want one where twins appear to be similar, you know, like, like DNA matching. Absolutely no good DNA matching for biometrics. As, it, um, as we know, twins' murders appear in quite a few books. Um, and it's very fast. And uh, the iris scan satisfies um, all of those properties. It's ex extensively used in India uh, in the um, what's called your Aadhaar number. Uh, which is a unique enrolment uh, system. If you want to qualify for social security in India, you enroll voluntarily in the Aadhaar system and your iris scan is measured. And they have iris um, cash terminals and various other things uh, so that people who can't write or people who are on the street, all they need to do is present there and they uh, can do the, use the system. I, they've enrolled, they have a wonderful dashboard which you can look at. I think they've enrolled 1.2 billion people in the system uh, yesterday when I looked. And um, as far as I can tell, they have never made an error. It's a big problem, actually. 1.2 billion, that is a lot of comparisons to do. The famous example of use of the Aadhaar number um, was made in uh, this case. Do you remember this photograph? This was the front cover of Time uh, magazine, uh, and um, oh, what's the name of this lady? I'll remember her name in a moment. Um, what they asked uh, was, could they go and track um, this uh, lady who was a refugee in Afghanistan? Um, 
uh, and uh, as, as predictable, uh, lots of people came forward thinking that there were uh, various possibilities in it for them. So John was asked to, John Daugman was asked to confirm that this lady, oops, sorry, uh, this lady was indeed the same lady as this lady, so he was able to extract the iris code and check that he, uh, she was uh, identical. Uh, look, it up on the, uh, look it up online, a very interesting and fascinating story. So that's a beautiful vision system. It's not a multi-scale system. It's a system that's precisely designed to solve one purpose. Now, I'm just going to quickly sort of segue into uh, another possibility. The, uh, when we're solving general vision problems, we, we've got this difficulty that I've alluded to, which a lot of the image really doesn't contain very much information. So a lot of people have been working on things called interest point operators. Um, this is an example of some interest point operators. Probably the most famous one is called uh, the SIFT algorithm. Uh, this is a speeded up version of it called the SURF algorithm. Um, there are also corners and all these sorts of things. And the idea there is instead of having to search every single frame in the, for possible matches, what I do is I just look for matches for, say, this point in the next frame, and that allows me to do all of the wonderful things to do with geometry and tracking and so on. So um, this is me, and it is now possible to sort of download and do this at home. Um, so this is me um, sitting at home over the weekend, and I ran a quick uh, corner detector on my face using some absolutely bog standard uh, code uh, available uh, for in MATLAB. And which is one of the signal processing packages that we use to do this. And then you can just track from frame to frame, and the, uh, the box is an example of that tracking. So you can see that as I move around, the box is doing its tracking, and I'm also throwing away points that no longer match. So you can see that as I make more and more outrageous motions in front of my little web camera, um, I'm throwing away more and more points. And what you do in reality, of course, is you would restart the uh, detector, rerun these things, and that's how face tracking works. It's really not very complicated. It's not a very grand theory. It's all in the art of what points should I choose, what algorithms should I should use for that, and there's some art in the precise way that you do the tracking. Um, now, that idea... Um, can be extended to looking at multiple object uh, tracking, which is uh, more and more challenging. Or you can start to use um, a little bit of uh, machine learning. So just to introduce that, I'm going to quickly... Um, actually, I think I might just skip this example of people tracking, because we've got a better tracking. And just quickly talk about machine learning. Machine learning and vision have been intimately related over the years. You know, they're very, very similar uh, things. And machine learning uh, has numerous applications, but I just very quickly want to explain it to you. And because it's um, that point in the lecture, I feel we know each other a bit better, I'm going to pick an application that I've worked on, um, which is about the detection of pornography. So I feel that we need a sort of more racy application. Um, so I'm going to talk about a, a form of learning called supervised learning. And supervised learning, what you do is you get a whole load of things where you are able to assign labels to those uh, features, and then you learn the relationship between the data and the labels. Uh, so I think I can explain this uh, reasonably well with some sort of illustration. So um, let's do that. Um, I'm just going to quickly skip over how we do this. I mean, we would, we, in the case of porn detection, we discovered that we could identify skin quite quickly. So this is doing us some skin segmentation. We would then extract from that some numbers. And in the parlance of machine learning, these numbers would be called features. And the features are said to represent the image. Now, what the features are, that's a guess. That's the art of machine learning. We don't really know what the features would be, but we'll try some. We'll do some experiments and we'll make a guess. So this is how machine learning uh, works. We would um, get, in this example, maybe an image. And we might say, well, that looks like a people image. I'm going to extract some features from that image. Well, number of skin blobs, percentage of skin, 
something else, something else, something else. Typically, these features might have, you know, uh, in the old days, these might have 10 or so numbers in it. Nowadays, they might have several thousand numbers. And we would often think about these as being plotted in some sort of space uh, like that. That's what we would call a feature space. So when people are talking about a feature space, that's what they mean. And the class here is the color of the blob. So this is face one, and it's represented by this light blue uh, blob here. So we just repeat all of that. We take another image, which is um, also a face. We take, uh, in this case, this is a um, cartoon image. This is a graphical image. This is a miscellaneous image, I think. Uh, this is, I can't remember what that was, miscellaneous image. And this was um, a rather more dubious image, because that's what we were interested in spotting. And each one of these colors indicates some sort of class. So this is how you prepare the data for a sort of supervised learning problem. So if I sort of simplify all of that, um, that's what we call the training data. So these are called feature vectors. These are the classes. They're usually represented by numbers. And now we're going to throw this at our machine learning algorithm. And, it, and we say, well, what class is this then? And what machine learning is all about is trying to intelligently make a guess as to what that is. And in the uh, transcript, I've done a much, much simpler little two-dimensional example, which I hope will make this all sort of crystal clear. OK, so that is the basic uh, idea behind machine learning. And the question is, um, well, let's, let's not talk about pornography detection anymore because it's a bit distasteful, but it was an interesting application. So let's just skip uh, that uh, issue. Uh, not, let's not talk about the performance, but let's talk about where we were. So sort of 10 years ago, that's where we were. We had this sort of dark art in vision, which was the extraction of features. And to extract the features, no real overarching theory, and uh, frankly, bad performance. So what's happened since then? You know, what has suddenly made this interest in um, machine learning? Well, um, this has happened. Deep learning. And deep learning is the thing that has revolutionized computer vision and, to some extent, all of the signal processing problems that exist. And I'll just give you a little example of deep learning in practice. This is a, a little bit of um, freeware. You could download um, this and use it yourself. This is a system called YOLO, and I'll show it, show it in operation, and then I'll quickly talk to you about it. So you can see what's going on here. There's an enormous set of classes which have been learnt for hours and hours using one of these deep learning systems. And it's pretty impressive. Uh, as somebody joked on the YouTube video, this is one of the best tie detectors I've ever seen. Uh, so anyone who seems to be wearing a tie is immediately detected. Okay, well that's enough of that. Now, um, I'll stop this. Okay. So, Deep learning is the topic of the next lecture. It's a highly controversial topic because it seems to throw away all of our basic understanding of how vision and everything work and replaces it all with this massive great black box which is able to go from pixels through to inference without, any, uh, without apparently any human intervention whatsoever. Just because time is pressing, I thought I would amuse you with, or I certainly amuse myself, with this observation of these, um, a bit of art from Tom Dininger, who is, uh, has a wonderful line in confusing the human vision system. Uh, you can go to his website and buy these pieces of artwork, which is yet another illustration of the fallibility of human vision.
So the next time you say, my human eyes don't deceive me, they jolly well do, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this has all been leading up to our lecture next month, which is going to take a look at this problem that I alluded to in this lecture of machine learning and try and pick apart in detail exactly how that works. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. Um, going back to the section where you had um, uh, the Gaussian blur part yeah. of it, yeah. were, is that developed into a program called Photoshop? Well, Photoshop does do Gaussian blurring. Um, actually, if you want to be, uh, let's be super nerdy about this. There is actually, technically, if you really want to not introduce any new extrema, you have to Gaussian blur in a very precise way. And... Um, it involves the multiplication of an exponential and a Bessel function to do it absolutely right. And as far as I can tell, Photoshop does not do that, but it gets jolly close. So um, Gaussian blurring is usually used as an artistic effect to replicate that sort of fuzzy feeling you get when things are out of focus, so I haven't got my spectacles on. Uh, what we're using it here to do very often is progressively blur in channels, blurry, 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 um, for those interest point operators, for example, they look for differences between channels. If they see significant differences, they say, oh, something's happened, I'll mark that as an interest point. That is beautifully timely, ladies and gentlemen. I was getting quite anxious that we might have um, time pressing on us. So thank you very much and uh, have a good evening. Thank you.